Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com. I'm here at E3 2014. Will's here also. He's not mic'd up. I'm also joined by Brandon Lotch. You're with Control VR, the director of gaming at this new startup. You guys just launched Kickstarter. Yep. And you guys have a product that's to introduce motion control for VR systems, like with the Oculus. Absolutely, yeah. So, Brandon, uh, Oculus does not have a motion control system. You use a gamepad when you're doing with Oculus or even with Sony's Morpheus prototype. You guys want to get your hands in the game. Now, there are systems like Leap Motion that already kind of do motion tracking, yep. kind of identify your fingers. Uh, how does your system work? So our system, first of all, what we wanted to do when we introduced motion to, to, uh, to VR gaming is we wanted to make sure we had full motion. We wanted to make sure it wasn't you know, just limited to a field of view of a camera right away. Uh, we wanted it to be so you could go behind your back. And ultimately, that's because of social. We wanted it to be in a place where you could very easily be able to communicate with others, basically reintroduce nonverbal communication to gaming. So what we've created is a, it's a Ford kinematic system. It uses 19 IMU sensors. So when you say IMU sensors, it's like these are modules, like Will's holding. This is like yes. one of the modules. And in each of these modules is a system of accelerometers and gyros. Yeah, accelerometer, gyros, and magnetometers. Okay. And the, the magnetometer is key because that's what keeps it drift free. Mm. And so as long as when we initialize, we initialize, and so it finds its, it finds its north. At that point, it can always recalibrate to that, and it always so it won't get off. Because one problem of, of inertial systems in the past has always been the drift over time. If you saturate the sensors, it'll get off. But because you have to recalibrate the, over again exactly, and again. Exactly. So because of the magnetometer, we're able to keep it north, and so it doesn't drift over time. So you can use it for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, and it stays right where it is. So the first so, time you put your hands together, the last time you put your hands together, it's the same spot. 19 of these IMUs in your system. Where do you strategically place them? So basically what we're doing, normally in, a, normally in 3D animation you use the node, you often you start with your pelvis. And so for this one what we're doing is we're actually starting the root of the system is the, is the chest sensor. And so we're assuming with the system, we're assuming a stationary pelvis and uh, basically using that as the root. And so we're applying the rotation that we take off of this sensor to drive the upper body of the torso. So even though we're using Oculus Dev Kit 1s in there, we actually get the same, some of the same effect of the DK2 where if you lean around, you actually get that, which eliminates a lot of the nausea. You reference skeletal modeling. That makes sense for game developers because when they're developing their game models, they usually have a pelvis, the upper body, yep. and then the arms and limbs that come off that. Yeah, usually your control input drives the position of the pelvis and everything else Got goes it. around okay, that. So upper body, it looks like the arc reactor, like an Iron Man. Yep. And this is your basis. <laughs> Everything references off that. Yes. So this is the root sensor for the Ford kinematic chain. Uh, from there, it goes to we we, we leverage the uh, the Oculuses, the IMU in there for head position. Okay. And then, but but for our system, we go down the the upper arms first, and that goes. So basically, by taking the rotation of your torso and assuming a shoulder width, we're able to get six degrees of freedom to the to the motion of your upper arm by taking the rotation off of that. And then the next in the chain is your is your forearm, and the forearm, assuming you're assuming you're parenting it, of course, to your to your arm it gives you six degrees of freedom down your arm. And then after that, we have the hand, and then we have one sensor per finger and two in the thumb. Ah, so in this finger, in this glove right now, yes. uh, there are sensors underneath each yes. of these fingers, and you can actually feel them. It's rigid on top. Yeah, they're about a half inch across. So basically the big breakthrough to make finger tracking possible like this was to have the sensors get down to the size so we could get it onto your pinky finger. And it needs to sit on top of that finger. And see yes. it, the, the, it's kind of rigid there, and then two in the thumb. And so there's actual finger movement now, in order to establish presence, like in the demo we saw, in that moon demo, the latency has to be low. So how, how are we getting the low latency with uh, the game demo? So the nice thing about the inertial sensors is they're actually doing all the processing on board. Is the idea that they're actually spitting quantarians out. And so the processing is handled there. So the nice thing about inertial technology is it doesn't really introduce much latency at all. The, the latency of the systems when they actually ship will be about four milliseconds for the sensor and the processor on that. And then it's really, as most of the latency you're coming from is your display, the USB connection, the game engine, pretty much everything else that comes after that. But the actual system itself is not contributing much. We did a test the, uh, just the other day where we pretty much, we took we filmed with a, with a red camera, we filmed at 240 frames a second. We filmed uh, doing a keystroke on a keyboard, so just hitting, you know, just hitting the L button, just to see what, how fun, and that took 42 milliseconds to go from input to motion. And then we took our system, we rotated the sensor, and we found that to be 54 milliseconds. So basically in its current state, our system's contributing to 12 milliseconds more lag than a keyboard input. And so oh, that's kind of a, great. the hard thing about lag is you can, you can kind of spin the numbers to whatever you want. And so it's trying to, we try to put it relative to other systems. And so 12 milliseconds slower than a keyboard input, which is obviously widely accepted as a, a fine input lag. So in terms of applications, obviously gaming, and that's what you're interested in. Yes. What type of games can you develop to use something like Control VR? So the amazing thing that we found is that really it changes, it changes everything for gaming. I mean, 
what, what attracts me is I find I'm always I'm, I'm the biggest I'm the biggest pusher for, for I don't want things to be gimmicky I don't want VR to be seen as a gimmick and to me like if you're taking your hands and pretending to aim a gun to me inherently that's that's gimmicky because I feel like gamers for the most part they want the path of least resistance they want to be able to they want to be accurate they want to be able to aim accurately but what this really introduces which has never been before in gaming is the social aspect it's, it's the nonverbal communication it's the idea that in a shooter you're walking up and you can you take your hand off your keyboard motion and, motion and gesture to somebody it's in a it's in a game it's, it really slows the pace of gaming down Whereas instead, you know, if you're playing a game such as like DayZ, you're able to go out and you're able to go out in the wilderness and you can sit there and you can kind of your change up, you can wave, you can interact, and it really humanizes the players, not just for yourself and the immersion of yourself, but also the other people you see. So now when someone, up to this point in gaming, I mean, most so much of gaming gravitates to, you know, it's just competitive, it's just, it's just shoot, 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 back and forth. But with this, it really slows it down to the point where it's like, you know, if this person's moving like a real person, that's somebody. They can go, no, 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 don't shoot me. And you're like, that's that's a human there. You can tell, and so it's really. So it, it's also made to complement other accessories. Like you can use this with the mouse and keyboard, and then the game developers have to be smart enough to know that when you're on that mouse and keyboard position, your game model isn't exactly doing that. You have thresholds, or you can even actually have like for a shooter holding a gun. Bring a prop. Yeah, that's, right. that's something we find. So if you if you're not holding anything, obviously a gun has a gun has weight, a gun has mass, and so you're able to move very fast. But if you actually hold the prop, then suddenly your avatar starts behaving how they how they should be behaving. And that can map then where the gun is pointing at, and then you can also take your hand off the gun and do gestures. Absolutely. In, in a tactical game. Yes. So outside of gaming, what are the non-gaming VR applications or non-VR applications for? For control VR. So the interesting thing about this technology is that while the while this initiative for VR use is, is very new, the technology is anything but. The technology has been developed by Ollie Cord over the last 20 years using inertial motion capture. And so there's actually of this very system, there's about 450 out in the field right now. They've been used for very high-end purposes. Uh, one one very unique purpose that I thought was interesting is they use them for uh, measuring the workload on on auto assembly workers huh. to basically have them wear this and, and capture their motion and be able to measure how much how much they're using their back, how much they're using their arms to be able to evenly distribute in order to in order to reduce injuries at the workplace. Uh, also medical for multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's put an inertial sensor on the on the chest and you can detect if somebody's if somebody's slouching over in their chair and then use robotics to straighten them up and auto calibrate back to the And I imagine place. even animation and motion capture. Of course animation it's yes yeah, really this is the first time that we've been able to get one finger capture is very rare. Often in motion capture, you have to go back in and hand and hand tweak the fingers. But for this, we want to get it at a consumer level. We want to get uh, get motion capture into the hands of game developers as well as filmmakers. Machinima. People are making animated movies. Machinima. Yeah, really. I'm a bit, I'm, I'm traditionally I'm a filmmaker, and uh, and I kind of I watched the transition in film school from film to digital, and I always I was always one of the early adopters of digital, saying no, this is the way it's going to go. And now the next evolution that, that I'm seeing is filming in general being replaced by in-engine rendering. And so really this technology is something that I think will be essential for creating and telling stories with motion capture in engine. Well, so where you guys are at the Kickstarter right now? Kickstarter actually just after after day five got, was funded yesterday, and so we passed our two hundred fifty thousand dollar goal, and uh, now we're we're going we're going beyond that. So at this point, I'm pretty sure we're up somewhere around two hundred seventy five thousand, but it's been it's been going great. The reception's been fantastic, and this is kept and this is going. intended for developers. I mean, yeah, this shipping right now up. is priced at six hundred dollars per unit, and it's it's really intent much more so than the Oculus Rift was when it came out. It's intended to be a dev kit. It's intended to be we want to get this. What's most important for us is to get finger control into the hands of developers right away, and so they can't. Because we feel that it's, it's necessary for VR in the long run, and so we want to get it to them as soon as possible so they don't waste time developing for things without fingers when they know they're going to have to switch over later. And so how on. easy would it be to adapt VR control, control VR systems into existing engines, the Unity and the Unreal, into games people are already making? So the awesome thing is both of the demos you played today, uh, without any SDK existing, uh, my team my team that developed those demos, they actually started on those demos about two weeks ago, and that was the first time they fired up. So so it's sort of a testament to the ease of use. It was it was two weeks in Unity from not having an SDK at all and really just getting it up and running and saw what you played today. And so and it only get easier as we develop the SDK and really get the equipment. And this ready. is a you know inertial based system, but you also might integrate some optics in the future? Yes. So right now the system's the system's limited. The relative movement of the system is hundred percent precise. But the but I it's mean, limited. In the beginning you calibrate, you put your hands to the you side. You get in your calibrate and you, it, 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 it maps you to a skeleton that's currently, you know, currently in a position. The position we're using right now is you stand in basically not a T pose, but you stand with your hands at your side. When you bring up the, the limitation of the accuracy of the motion is only to how accurate you are to that skeleton. So theoretically, you could have your perfect initialization where you got everything right, but most likely you're going to be 95% of the way there. So when you bring your hands up in real space, they might be here, but in the game, they might be there. And the nice thing is the movement's consistent throughout, but to correct this, what we're working on is an optical verification system where we use a depth camera to pretty much to look at your as the second stage of initialization, look at the location of your hands and adjust your shoulder rotation and adjust the scale of your skeleton to fit more your personal skeletal scale and get things lined and up. And when you say a depth camera, 
something like the leap motion, like not the necessarily leap motion, a webcam. Yes. Okay, awesome. The nice thing is we don't have to worry, we don't have to wait for leap motion or something to get more to get more range on it because we can just bring it up nice and close right there right now. Get a good track locked, scale your skeleton, and then you're ready to go and locked in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brandon, for telling us a little bit about Control VR. Absolutely. Good luck on the Kickstarter, and people can check out their Kickstarter on their website and more videos from E3 2014 on test.com. I'm Norm, that's Will. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you guys. Okay, so we just had the Control VR demo. Uh, I walked in pretty skeptical because we've seen a lot of kickstarted motion capture, motion control demos. A lot of bad motion control demos. Um, and this one, this one even though bad. the the product looked like it was handmade and early prototypes, I think they said it was handmade. Uh, it was really good. Yeah, though. So the actual modules were actually seemed like they'd been mass produced or you know pre-made. But the, the, the setup was a little bit janky. Once you got it on, it was great. Like you held up your hand in front of your face, you moved it open and closed your hand, you turned it, you had full, like there was very little lag, almost imperceptible. I didn't notice anything, I don't know if you did. Very, very little lag. You got the sense of presence with yeah. your hands and fingers. And it wasn't just your fingers, it was your whole arm. And, and it was the rotation too. Like you could rotate, I could move my hand like this. We uh, kind of tried to high five mm -hmm. badly. It was a little bit embarrassing. But like that thumbstick in the right in the left hand actually did a really nice job of kind of letting me move through the game. So that's an interesting thing. When you're looking at something like Sony's Morpheus system, you use move, you're holding on to something. You mm -hmm. know, you hold on to a stick, or, or when you use a stem system, the stem system looks like a pistol. When you hold the, the uh, move system, it looks like a bat or it looks like a bow, so you have that haptic feedback. When you're just capturing your fingers, there's nothing really to grip onto. Well, but it's not just your fingers, it. it's also your forearms and your, you show the whole thing. Right, so you can't really have, you can't play with like an imaginary gun, you need a prop. I think that, I think that if you're thinking about using guns with this, with Control VR, you're probably thinking about it wrong. I think what this is for is, when we talked to Nate earlier today, and he was talking about next-gen VR experiences, I think that's what the, the finger tracking and the gloves are for. It's literally reaching out and catching a ball. It's doing some sculpting in a, in a 3D space. Magic missiles. These are for casting magic missiles Ma into in the video darkness. Game. Yeah, this is what Kinect promised, except as opposed to huge latency and you know just random yeah. gestures, you actually can do finger detailed movements. Well, the big difference is it worked. That's the, the you know, connect, not so much. This, yes, even at the early phase. Yeah. Now the, the things, there's, there's some stuff they have to work on. The calibration process was a little tricky because you had to align yourself with the South Pole uh, in order to get the, the magna magnetometer in the, in the IMUs lined up right. And you had to hold yourself very rigidly in a position right. so that it knew, how, so that your skeleton was aligned with its skeleton. That was a little tricky for me as somebody who'd never done it before. And that's something that only works when you're standing up. You imagine a lot of people when they're playing games are sitting down, the, which is why he said that when you incorporate something like the, the leap motion to verify your calibration or calibrate on the fly, right. then you double up. And the thing they said is that, that like putting this, this is the first time they put this in front of a bunch of people. Already they have tons of stuff that they know they need to go back and address and, and update and fix. And they don't have an FCK yet. So it's yeah. still super early. I think the Kickstarter has only been going for a few days. But still, this is probably the most promising motion tracking thing I've seen to date. I don't think this is a 2015 product. Oh, no. This is a 2016, 2017 product. I think they're going to be bought by the end of the month. Yeah, I think that they will. My guess is that for this to succeed, it will probably need to be acquired, and maybe like a second generation Oculus, yeah. second generation Morpheus will have something like well, this. Well, the Oculus guys know that they need to address this. I think Sony thinks that the move is the solution. Yeah. I'm not sure that they're right. Maybe for games it is, but not for like productivity VR experiences. Anyway, it's very it was exciting. really cool. Yeah, we'll see you guys. We have more from E3 coming up soon. Uh, until then, I'm Will. Norm. See you guys later. Bye.